Hey everybody, this is Darren Van Dam, and you are watching Flick Connection, the show that helps you get more out of movies, and today we're going to be talking about the absolute best sci-fi movies you can currently catch on HBO Max. So in this video, we're going to be talking about the 20 best sci-fi movies currently included with HBO Max. Many of these are also on a basic HBO subscription, but many, in fact my top 10, are among some of the best science fiction movies ever made because HBO Max currently has just an incredible selection. So this video is actually going to include more than 20 because I will mention several honorable mentions about halfway through this list before we get to my top 10. But enough of that, let's go ahead and start this list off with my number 20 pick, Oblivion. Now, as mediocre as this movie actually shakes out to be, I do still consider it to be an underrated sci-fi movie. And even though Tom Cruise has not done many sci-fi movies, I would easily put Minority Report and The Edge of Tomorrow or whatever they call that movie this year above this one, but still, Oblivion has some incredible visuals and a pretty decent story. Now, the story itself, I felt like ended up falling a little bit flat. It wasn't quite as epic and as grand as I was hoping, meaning you're in this incredible post-apocalyptic wasteland, yet the actual story at the core was a little bit on the thin side, which is why this ends up my number 20 pick, despite it having some incredible visuals, but ultimately the story is strong enough, and again, those visuals are well worth revisiting this movie if it's been a while since you've seen it. I can already hear some grumblings over my next pick, not because of the one that I pick, but because I put it way towards the back at number 19, and that is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This is based on the famous book by Douglas Adams. They did a teleplay radio thing, and then this is the movie. The reason I have it so far back, even though there is a lot to love about The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is it's kind of a mediocre take on what is an otherwise excellent and really well-revered science fiction book. And not to say anything bad about the filmmakers or the writer that adapted this into a screenplay, they have decent work in their filmographies, but I'm not quite sure this movie was produced the right way. It does have a decent cast, yet again, the filmmakers, the writers, I don't know that they quite did the original work justice with this movie. However, I did say there's a lot to love. Again, incredible visuals, but a really great role from Martin Freeman, Zoe Deschanel, most deaf, because that is what his name was when this movie was made, and Sam Rockwell. And then you've got just amazing character actors doing all these different costumed characters and things, which brings up another thing I love about it, a lot of practical, not effects, there's a lot of CGI in this, but a lot of practical makeup and costumes that just look really fantastic on screen. Obviously, it's got a good sense of humor, but the movie feels like it goes by incredibly quick. Maybe one day they'll turn this into, I don't know, a Netflix series or something that might do this book a little bit better justice. But for now, this is all we've got. And with that, we're going to travel back to 1981 with one of the darker ones featured on this list, Scanners. This is directed by David Cronenberg. It's one of his earlier works, and as such, it's one of his less weird works. This movie revolves around people who have telekinetic powers that are so strong they can actually cause people's heads to explode, and that happens quite frequently in this movie. Speaking of effects, there are fantastic practical effects in this of heads exploding. It's a trickier thing to pull off on camera than you would think, and they look, as gross as they are, they look incredible in this movie, and then you do get a kind of a cool story that doesn't get too lost along the way with just absolute weirdness that David Cronenberg is more known for. In terms of his twisted body horror movies, of which there are quite a few, I find Scanners to be the most easily accessible one, so long as you're not totally turned off to exploding heads. And then we're gonna jump from that weird pick to the weirdest one on this list, and easily one of, if not the weirdest science fiction movies ever made. It's so weird, it's hard to even tell if it's actually science fiction, but it is classified that way. I'm talking about David Lynch's Eraserhead. Now, when talking about Eraserhead, it's important to keep in mind this came out in 1977, and it is highly experimental, but it would go on to launch one of the most interesting directing careers in Hollywood history. After this was released, Mel Brooks hired David Lynch to direct The Elephant Man, which went on to win a bunch of Academy Awards, but this movie 
is possibly his strangest and he has directed some really strange movies. So with that, I do not actually recommend Eraserhead for everybody, but I do recommend it for everybody with a real passion for movies and a real interest in them because even if you don't end up liking this movie, and I'll be honest, it is a very difficult movie to enjoy. It is that weird. It's kind of a rite of passage. Again, I say this a lot. If you consider yourself to be a movie buff, even if you're a budding one, this is kind of required viewing because it did influence a lot of things in small ways that you will notice depending on kind of how deep your knowledge of movie making goes. On the other hand, if you don't like really far out there bizarre stuff, Eraserhead is a great sort of litmus test as to who can handle the weirdest movies ever made and who can't. Odds are about 90% of you watching are not gonna really like this movie at all. So with that, let's move on. And my next pick is appropriate because this is one of the best crowd pleasers on this list. Now, it is not as good as the original The Matrix, which may or may not be featured later on this list, but it is similar in a lot of ways, including the style, and it's almost equally as badass. I'm talking about Equilibrium starring Christian Bale. Now this takes place in a dystopian future where thoughts and emotions are controlled by several means, one including a drug, all books are burned, all creativity and, and pizzazz, if you will, has been stripped out of life. And Christian Bale plays an enforcer, someone who's over to go around and round up people who have books or are doing paintings or whatever. And he's got this really interesting fighting style. Again, this takes place in the future. It's far from realistic, but it is a marvel to watch. And on its face, it looks like a ripoff of The Matrix. A lot of the style and everything looks like they pulled it right from The Matrix, and they might have. This came out just three years after The Matrix originally released, but the story is completely different and well worth watching. This is one of the better picks on the list that I know a lot of people still haven't seen, and if it's been a while since you've seen it, there's a very good chance you forgot how badass this movie actually is. And so far on this list, we've had a couple rated R picks with exploding heads and things like that, and then some PG-13 picks that are good for the family. My next pick though, while it is PG-13, I think it's regrettably so. I think it's the weakest part of I Am Legend. Now, I Am Legend is technically a remake of a remake. The Last Man on Earth came out in 1964, starring Vincent Price. Then in 1971, you had a remake of that called The Omega Man, starring Charlton Heston. Both good movies. And then you have I Am Legend, which is a lot like both of those movies, but it leans a little bit harder into zombie territory because zombie movies were so popular at this time. And I think that's sort of where this movie goes around is it kind of wants to do two things. It wants to be sort of a remake of the Omega Man and the Last Man on Earth, and in that sense, it is quite good. I love the scenes where Will Smith is just living in this overgrown Manhattan. He's hunting, he's, for lack of a better word, renting movies, playing golf, and trying to survive the night. I thought all of that stuff was fantastic, and then the movie starts to lose me with its computer-generated villains. While these are overpowered zombies, they easily could have been done with real people and maybe some effects, and I think they would have been much more menacing. As a result, they don't look real, and it actually takes down this movie quite a bit, and there's really no blood or anything like that, so it's not as violent as you might expect it to be as well. That all said, I like a lot, if not everything that's in I Am Legend. I just wish they had gone a little bit harder with it, made it a little more terrifying, and I think it would have hit home a lot harder. Now my next pick is the first of two Terry Gilliam movies on this list, and no, Brazil is not on the list, even though I do consider that to be one of the best sci-fi movies ever made, and easily his best sci-fi movie ever made, but that is not included on HBO Max right now. 12 Monkeys is, however. Now this went on to spawn a series that I have heard good things about, but this movie stands alone on its own as a great Terry Gilliam movie. This is one of his darker movies in terms of the look and feel, the production design. He generally does have kind of a dark tone. This one though is easily his most grim looking movie and story-wise it's pretty grim as well. This too takes place in a dystopian future and features time travel. And it features time travel in a fashion you're typically not used to seeing 
entertaining, and Terry Gilliam, as brilliant as he is, manages to make it work in this movie. You also get not just a great performance from Bruce Willis, but you get a really great one from Brad Pitt with that wonky eyeball and everything. And the story here is so wild and out of control, yet a director like Terry Gilliam is such a good storyteller, he manages to keep this thing glued together pretty well, making it just an excellent science fiction watch. Now, while I don't recommend watching 12 Monkeys with the family, Terry Gilliam's other pick on this list is my next pick, and I do recommend it for families. It is called Time Bandits. This is one of his earlier movies, and while you can tell, it is also just incredibly impressive that he pulled this thing off. This thing is filled to the brim with practical effects. Wild costumes, puppetry, sets, optical illusions, and a story that glues it all together. In this movie, a young boy joins this band of dwarves that are jumping from time period to time period, so you get all sorts of different stuff jumbled up in this movie. Sean Connery has a really great appearance in it, and some just dazzling visuals. For the time that this came out, this stuff was cutting edge, and Terry Gilliam's work not only got better, but continued to influence a bunch of other filmmakers as well, so this one too, I would consider to be required viewing. Just just for the spectacle of all of the practical effects. Now the only animated movie to officially make the top 20 on this list is one of my favorite animated movies of all time, The Iron Giant. This was released in 1999 and is one of the last big budget, hand-drawn animated movies. Now there are some computer effect shots in this movie, mostly of the robot from time to time, but it has got a beautiful sort of vintage look to it, which is appropriate because of the time period where it takes place. You get some amazing Cold War stuff wrapped up in what is essentially a very family-friendly movie, so it's really engaging and entertaining for adults, but obviously kids will have a blast with it because it's about a giant robot, and the storytelling here is top-notch. This is directed by Brad Bird, who would go on to do The Incredibles, he would go on to do Mission Impossible 4, which is one of my favorites. He is a brilliant action director, and Iron Giant has quite a few scenes of action in it that are just really expertly crafted. If you've never seen this one and it's been a while since you've seen a really good animated movie with the family, this one I, I cannot recommend enough. The only reason it doesn't make the top 10 is because the top 10 is so strong on this particular list. And with that, we'll go to my number 11 pick, which is possibly one of, if not the most realistic science fiction movies ever made, Contact. Now, I say realistic because 90% of this movie feels incredibly grounded. In fact, the first half is almost a little on the dull side because it's so grounded and feels so real. If you don't know, there are plenty of sites around the world that are constantly scanning the skies, trying to find any kind of signs of intelligent life, including forms of radio signals. And so far, we haven't really found anything. There have been a couple of exceptions where we've seen some weird stuff, but this movie supposes what might happen when we do finally hear from another world. Now, obviously, once that happens, that's where we start to go into the science fiction territory, but because this movie balances out science fact with fiction so well, it always feels grounded, even when Jodie Foster is hurtling through time and space. It still manages to focus on what's important about this type of discovery and has a really good message at its core. It's one of the best overall movies on this list in terms of just drama, acting, production, but because the sci-fi elements are a little bit thin, it doesn't quite make it into the top 10, even though it would easily top other lists maybe sometime in the future, probably even in the past. I'm sure I've added on a list before. We won't beat the machines by making them our slaves. Better to let them join us by choice. That world we show them isn't real. To an artificial mind, all reality is virtual. Now, while The Iron Giant is the only animated movie on the official list, I did include The Animatrix on the honorable mentions. This is just a stunning collection of shorts that all pertain back to The Matrix. They're each done in their own animation style from a different animation studio, and every single story is good. I highly recommend this. This not only makes a great pair to The Matrix, but could make a great thing to watch before The Matrix 4 comes out, which is a movie I will be discussing 
later on in this video. Keep in mind, it will also be available on HBO Max in very short order. Cloverfield also makes my honorable mentions. Just a good, fun monster movie. It's reminiscent of old Godzilla movies, but it does enough different to make it stand out. And I don't just mean the shaky cam found footage stuff. I mean the fact that you never really get a good look at the monster until the end. Things like that really make this movie work. And if it's been a while since you've seen it, I can tell you there's a lot more horror elements wrapped up in this. This is a really great adventure that has a lot of great sequences in it that you have probably forgotten about. In a similar vein, I recommend Underwater. This is one of the newer release movies on this list. And I think it got a bad rap. While it didn't get terrible reviews, it didn't get very good ones either, and I can kind of see why, but I do maintain that this movie is still a lot better than people give it credit for. Once it kicks off in like the first five minutes, it really doesn't let up at all. And even though the production design is reminiscent of movies like Alien, in fact, it has so much in common with Alien, I think that's where a lot of the negative reviews come from. The comparison was made, and it's nowhere near as good as a masterpiece like Alien, but if you didn't make that comparison at all, this is a pretty fun popcorn movie that has a lot to offer and visually has a lot going on on screen. So if you passed on this one because you didn't think it was going to be very good, go into it with low to no expectations and you will be pleasantly surprised. While Eraserhead was the weirdest one to make the list, Fantastic Planet is probably the weirdest sci-fi movie ever made or at least the weirdest one that people still talk about. This movie is actually somewhat famous for people watching while they're on psychedelics, and just from looking at some of the visuals, you can see why. However, trust me, you can't enjoy this movie without the help of psychedelics, but it is foreign language. It's not gonna be for everybody. Again, if you consider yourself a movie buff, this one's probably gonna be worth watching, even if you don't end up enjoying it by the end. And with that, I'll wrap up my honorable mentions with Event Horizon. The reason that doesn't make this list is it was just featured on a horror list I did for Halloween, but I still highly recommend this movie. However, I do need to tell you, it is one of the darkest sci-fi movies ever made. Not just dark like a movie like Alien or something like that. Well, it has a lot in common with Alien. It gets much darker by the end, so this is not for people with a weak stomach, but if that gets you excited, then I can tell you for a fact that Event Horizon is your type of movie. Now, with that, let's move on to my top 10. Now, both my number 10 and number nine picks are both from Christopher Nolan, who I think is one of the best science fiction directors ever and certainly among the best working today. My number 10 pick is Tenet, and I'll go ahead and tell you my number nine pick is Inception, because I'm going to explain why these two are in that order. I consider Tenet to be the bigger achievement. It is the most different thing to have come out in a really long time. And it is just Christopher Nolan distilled. It's this really interesting idea that gets expounded upon and gets to be almost too complicated to comprehend, certainly in one sitting, but even after multiple sittings, and that is why I don't think it's better than Inception. Ultimately, while I do think Tenet is the more brilliant puzzle with more layers and a lot more going on, and again, the bigger achievement, I do think Inception is the better movie because it is more entertaining and not just more appealing to broad audiences. Even though it is that, it tells the story better because you can keep up with what's going on despite the fact that it is this wildly different thing than anything you've ever seen, except for maybe the movie Paprika. But that comparison is maybe for another video. And I just like the look of it, the soundtrack, everything I think is better in Inception. But that said, Tenet has some amazing scenes of action, most of which you see on screen is happening in camera, even though they're playing a lot of it in reverse. You're seeing a real plane crash into a building. You're seeing real explosions with real debris. You're seeing the real John David Washington out on the end of a ladder performing a heist on the highway. Everything is essentially really happening. Again, making Tenet really an amazing pick, but as much as I'm gushing about it, the storytelling is just so much stronger in Inception. But with that, we're gonna move on to my next pick, which I've already mentioned more than once, The Matrix. Now, I'll be honest, I could not be less excited for The Matrix 4. It really just looks like they're rehashing a lot of the original movie, and I don't know how they could possibly think they're gonna top it. I think the original, The Matrix, as much as I did enjoy the sequels, the original stands alone, 
on its own as one of the greatest sci-fi movies ever made. And even though it did borrow from a lot of different places, the Wachowskis did a really great job of bringing all those things together. Kung Fu, anime, science fiction, there's a long list and they glued all of that together not only in a really interesting concept and story with a great production design But it's really well directed just as an example the lobby shootout scene Which is still to this day one of the most famous shootout scenes in movie history is that because it was so expertly directed. Not only does it look cool with a really cool concept that gets delivered, but you always know who's standing where, who's shooting at who, who's doing what, and you're never getting lost in the geography of this room. And that's a tricky thing to do. The camera always has to be in the right position on the right side of a character. Otherwise, you're gonna get jumbled up as to who's where, who's shooting at who, and it's just absolute chaos. And what you get with the Matrix is this really controlled chaos. What feels like a totally chaotic scene tells you a story and you are able to follow it. That is no small feat whatsoever. And based on all of the Wachowskis' other movies, some of which I liked okay, I just do not possibly see how they're gonna f with the original Matrix. I could be wrong, I hope that I am, but I'm probably not. Now, I'm honestly not sure where to put my next pick. I'm putting it number seven because it has not been long enough for us to really judge this movie, but I'm confident it goes at least here, possibly higher. I'm talking about Dune. No, I'm not talking about the David Lynch one. I'm talking about the new one, which will not be available on HBO Max much longer. I'll also say, I highly recommend seeing this movie in IMAX if you still have the option. I have watched it in my home theater with a large projection screen and headphones. It is a great way to watch that movie. IMAX still beats the pants off of it. Dune is one of the most beautiful movies I have seen in years. It's incredibly consistent and it's so well done. It literally feels as if you've been transported to this world that takes place 10,000 years in the future. It's completely removed from our reality, yet it still feels like a place you could go to and that you could inhabit. I was not alive when the original Star Wars came out, but I would imagine that audiences in the 70s felt something similar to what I felt watching Dune in 2021. I'm not saying it's the same, but there's a lot of similarities, and I think what the new Dune does so much better than a lot of what Disney has been producing with the new Star Wars movies is that it does something new and different, and it does it in a way that audiences are clearly connecting with. Now, another reason Dune is at number seven and not higher on this list is because it's really not complete. This is part one of two, and it is not a finished story, and I think as time goes on, not only will this movie still be watched and revered 10, 20, 30 years from now, but I do think decades from now, if I'm right and people are still talking about this movie, they'll be talking about parts one and two as one singular piece. Now, in terms of the filmmaking and the overall quality, my next pick isn't the best on this list, but in terms of staying power and influence over the decades, Planet of the Apes still holds up as one of the best sci-fi movies of all time. And not just because it has some of the most iconic lines in movie history in it. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. And not just because it spawned countless, and I mean literally countless, sequels and spin-offs, but it does a great job of conveying its message. It's got a lot to say about humanity, who we are despite what we look like and what we think we know about the universe. Planet of the Apes, with a very simple concept, says so much about who we are as people. It really is miraculous. As many movies as they made, while some of them are quite good, I still think the original is the best for a bunch of reasons, but mainly the storytelling and what they're trying to get across is just the most successful here with this one. Ooh, man, okay, so this list is a doozy of a list, but now we're at my top five, and HBO Max has so many good sci-fi movies right now that these top five are among my top 10 sci-fi movies ever made. And my number five pick is not only one of the best sci-fi movies ever made, it's also one of the best action movies ever made and certainly one of the best to have come out within the last 10 years or so. I'm talking about Mad Max Fury Road. I am the one who runs from both the living and the dead. A man who would 
reduced to a single instinct. Survive. Now, real quickly, I love the production design. That includes the costumes, the sets, the way that this movie looks. Love it, absolutely love it. I think it's easily the best looking Mad Max movie ever made, and even one of the best sort of apocalyptic wastelands ever put to screen. But the reason it makes this placement and why I love this movie so much is it tells a story in a fashion almost unlike any other movie ever made. And you may be thinking, well, what's the story? They leave, they get out to the desert, they turn around, they go back. No. The story is all the little things that happen along the way. And again, Fury Road manages to tell that story amid absolute chaos. So while you're watching these cars and monster trucks and dirt bikes try to overtake one another, knowing that the engines and sort of the concept of this movie is a metaphor for power and this struggle for power, that's what these vehicles represent out in this wasteland. So not only is that cool and you get to see all this great stuff that again, they built for real. All these cars they built for real and a lot of the crashes and everything you see are actually happening on camera. So not only is all of that happening, but they're telling you the story beat by beat. There's a lot going on in each sequence that far exceeds monster truck tries to ram into bigger truck. The camera is constantly cutting from character to character, not just giving you their reactions, but giving you their reactions to what we'll call monkey wrenches being thrown into their plans at every single turn. It's wild stuff and it was so carefully planned out it just exceeds anything that's done in this genre today. I hope they eventually get around to making a sequel. If Warner Brothers and the creators can ever stop bickering, apparently this is over like a $5 million dispute. That's why we don't have a sequel to Mad Max Fury Road yet. That said, this movie still holds up today for me, and it is hard to beat out of things to watch on HBO Max right now, except for my top four picks. But my number four pick is the reason I decided to make this list. I guess technically Dune was, but the fact that they have this next movie is why I wanted to make this list because it is not only one of my favorite sci-fi movies ever made, I can guarantee about 98, maybe even 99% of you watching have not only never even seen it, you've never even heard of Stalker. Released in 1979, Andrei Tarkovsky's masterpiece Stalker is still, still to this day, ahead of its time. So kind of like a racer head, this is another one that I do not recommend for everybody, but it will be accessible to a larger audience. The only thing I'm really gonna tell you about this one is that it is incredibly long and incredibly slow paced, and it explains very little as to what's going on to you with dialogue. So while this movie is Russian language and you will have to read subtitles, and there are some long monologues in it that you'll have to keep up with, the entirety of the movie does not have that much dialogue in it. Most of what you're seeing is being conveyed to you visually, and it has a wild science fiction concept at its core, and it's delivered to you with little to no visual special effects. But the way that this movie was filmed lulls you into a dreamlike state, and then the movie exploits that. So again, this is an incredible movie for anyone who considers themselves a budding movie buff. If you feel like you need to watch everything, you need to see everything that has influenced everything, Stalker is gonna be a must watch. Keep in mind, it is paced slower than almost anything you've seen before, but it is a journey unlike anything you've done before. If you like artsier movies, this is going to be your new favorite discovery. I cannot believe it's on HBO Max right now. If you love the way I've described it, definitely seek out Stalker and watch it soon because I don't expect it to be around much longer. But if you don't like slower paced movies, don't worry, I've got something else for you on this list. Another movie that was ahead of its time when it was released in 1982 is Blade Runner. But as we enter the 20s with movies releasing like Tenet and Dune, it appears that time is caught up to Blade Runner. Which is appropriate because Blade Runner actually takes place in the year 2019. So obviously their view of the future was a little bit off by a handful of decades, but 
Blade Runner has one of the most amazing looks to a science fiction movie. I think when you look at scenes from this movie, it's very important to remember that this was released in 1982. And yes, there were big spectacle movies before that, but nothing that quite looked like this, making Blade Runner incredibly original, and the cyberpunk look of it has been copied countless times. Not only that, but Blade Runner manages to be a really fantastic delivery device for this world, or rather the world is a great delivery device for this particular story. It's chicken and the egg stuff, but this is Ridley Scott at the top of his game. I still consider this and Alien to be two of the greatest science fiction movies ever made, and he only made them a few years apart from each other. I also do consider the final cut to be the better way to watch the movie. It's remastered, it looks amazing, it's in the original aspect ratio, and they didn't add too much to muddy it up. It's not George Lucas stuff where they add all these CGI characters and creatures. Just a few subtle things to help enhance and elevate it that don't really detract from the original story. But my next pick quite literally stands on the shoulders of Blade Runner because it is the sequel Blade Runner 2049. Now, I know some of you would easily put the original Blade Runner above it, and in terms of achievement, I think you're probably correct, but rarely does a sequel, especially one made this many decades after the original, rarely do movies like that come across as successfully as Blade Runner 2049. Not only is this a really fantastic follow-up to Blade Runner because it connects the stories so well, it also tells its own story really well. And while it does look like it's in the same world as the original Blade Runner, it takes place 30 years from that future, so it does look different enough to be its own thing. I think Ryan Gosling and Sylvia Hoex made this movie work. Both of their characters are just incredible, and there's a fantastic supporting cast to this movie. It's one of my favorite things I've seen Harrison Ford in in a long time, but Gosling and Hoex just, are doing next level stuff in this movie, particularly her. I think she's one of the best villains depicted in a movie in recent memory. I absolutely love this movie. It's from the same director as Dune. It's difficult to say with time whether I'm gonna continue to love this one more than Dune, but I am a little more partial. As beautiful as Dune was, I'm a little more partial to the cyberpunk wasteland of Blade Runner 2049. I consider it to be one of the most beautiful movies to have come out in the 21st century so far. And with that, we're gonna go to one of the most beautiful movies to have been released in the 20th century, and what is really regarded as one of the greatest sci-fi movies ever made. I'm talking about Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. And as far as space movies go, this one is beyond epic. In fact, it's beyond a movie for multiple reasons. One, it's infinitely influential. It was released nine years before the original Star Wars, and I know you have been told that George Lucas pioneered special effects with all of the space flight stuff in Star Wars, and while some of that is true, he learned everything he knew from Stanley Kubrick and what he did with 2001. So this was the first time anyone had seen anything like this on film, and it completely rivaled anything that had come before it. Had Stanley Kubrick not gone out on a limb and created something that felt as realistic as this, there's no telling how many movies we would not have today. This quite literally changed the landscape of movie making, particularly sci-fi movie making, from that day forward. And it's still influencing things. And that will likely never end as long as we're still making movies. It's also more than just a movie because it is multiple shorter stories. It opens up with sort of the dawn of man and it takes its time getting into space travel. But the transition is magical to say the least and then you get a space adventure and honestly as slow paced as it feels at times if you keep in mind the fact that no audiences had ever seen anything remotely like this at the time you will understand why Stanley Kubrick was so patient with these long shots of space travel because not only are they a marvel to witness but they gradually again just like stalker they lull you into the universe in which this takes place and then finally it is intended to be incomprehensible while a lot of the story elements are pretty straightforward and you can follow it and see it and there's even kind of a horror element with hal 9000 
Ultimately, the conclusion of this is one of the most puzzling in movie history, and while there is a message you can comprehend, the message is basically that space and whatever is out there is beyond our comprehension. Because that is the most likely scenario. There's only three possible scenarios that could come out of space travel. One, we learn that there's nothing out there. We're the only living, intelligent thing in the universe. Two, things appear to be exactly as we imagine them to be. Or three, they are way beyond anything that we can comprehend. Stanley Kubrick understood this, and he delivered it in a way that is absolutely mind-blowing. It is without a doubt a must-watch for anybody that considers himself to be a movie lover. You are missing out on so many references, so much influence. If you don't understand where a lot of this stuff originated with 2001 A Space Odyssey. And finally, because it is so important, I'm going to repeat it again. You have to keep in mind, this was made in 1968. You don't have to keep that in mind because it doesn't look very good and you gotta remember it's old. No, you need to keep that in mind because it looks so incredible. It looks, most of it, looks as if they could have filmed it yesterday. And for this to have been made in 1968, is nothing short of miraculous. But that is the list. I know I packed a lot into this video. If you appreciate these longer videos, be sure to let me know down in the comments below. I will read them. While you're down there, also help me thank those Patreon supporters. If you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, there's a link in the video description, along with a link to today's sponsor, Universal Yums. There's also a link down there where you can become a channel member and get access to exclusive reviews right here on YouTube, like my extended Dune review, which is available now. But I will keep making these videos for you as long as you keep watching them. Thanks for checking out this sci-fi episode, and you will see me on the next one.